If you bother paying any attention at all, you'll often notice that the problem that your favorite politician is promising to fix today is the same one that he promised to fix decades ago, and not just the exact same problem, but the exact same politician personally, too. For example, if you're one of the five or so people who actually read Joe Biden's book that he published right before he became vice president, ironically titled Promises to Keep, you may know that Biden wrote about how on his election to the Senate in 1972, he had to tell establishment Democrats to get federal spending under control because the people of Delaware understood that their paychecks weren't keeping up with inflation. Good intentions had to be balanced with good finances, he wrote. And so he committed to requiring a solvent way to pay for any bill before he would support it. I'd like to hear the White House's current explanation for how exactly that promise was kept, but that's the point. They aren't. It's not a partisan thing. It's just a politician thing. And it's just as true in the context of today's story as well. Here's then San Francisco Mayor, now California Governor Gavin Newsom, explaining his 10-year plan to end homelessness in 2008. We believe fundamentally that food solves hunger, that shelters solve sleep, and that housing solves homelessness. And that's why we established this framework, what we call a 10-year plan to end chronic homeless in San Francisco. The more things change, the more they stay the same, or maybe the worse they get. In the case of San Francisco, simply maintaining status quo levels of homelessness would have been a relative success, actually. Because in the years after the announcement of that plan, the problem has worsened, both in the number of homeless people on the streets of San Francisco and in the number of dollars that the city has thrown at it. But of course, Gavin Newsom has been promoted to over a decade in state government as both the lieutenant and the governor, now aiming his ambitions at the White House itself. But it's the spirit of the problem that's worsened, too. It's not just the population of the homeless or the spending to address it. It's also the sheer viciousness of it, both the viciousness of enabling these living conditions and somehow calling it compassionate, and the viciousness of the homeless themselves. Because according to this latest report out of Los Angeles, these aren't your friendly railroad track wandering handkerchief on a stick hobos of yesteryear. These are guys openly threatening to kill you when they're not just taking a dump on your property, of course, which is the kinder treatment, certainly a lot kinder than burning it down, too. You wanna have a fight? You think I'll play when I say you gotta die? You really gotta die. You gotta die. You gotta get your half-naked ass out of my restaurant right now. They've dealt with fires caused by the unhoused. Aggression on a daily basis. Woman, I found another woman's head in the fighter. Like this man who openly defecates on Ventura Boulevard and on this day tosses a bag of his bodily waste onto business owner Paul Scrivano's SUV. As inviting as it is to crack a joke about such a shitty situation, it's really only funny through the hilarious distances of the internet, because if you've spent your entire life building a business and someone is literally shitting all over it on a daily basis, whatever joke there may be in that scenario, I'm sure, gets old very quickly. And besides, this isn't just a problem of the inconveniences of cleaning up a streak or a smear here or there. This is a problem with serious criminality and serious safety concerns. According to the LA Times, the city's homeless encampments were responsible for 24 fires a day last year, accounting for over half of all the fires that the city responded to. And sure, a lot of those were merely dumpster fires in symbolic appreciation for the city's hellscape, but many were much more serious. Seven LA homeless people died in fires in 2020. Businesses have been damaged on a scale of tens of millions of dollars, according to the fire department. And for the business owners in this particular news piece, there's frequent theft and assault too. The homeless stealing food off of customers' street side plates and then attacking staff if they want to challenge it. Literally come by and just grab something and, and carry on. That happens all the time. My manager had to step in the middle and get um, get the person off of her, and he got hit, he got assaulted, and one of the guests got hit in the face. Now, I call these things crimes just in the traditional layman moral sense, not necessarily in the technical legal sense, because in the technical legal sense in Los Angeles, they aren't. According to one of the business owners seeking help from police and politicians, LAPD informs him they are no longer allowed to issue citations or even respond to the following issues. Public urination or defecation, 
indecent exposure, littering, or, yes, even terroristic threats if there's no weapon present. So even if there is some sort of right to live and take a dump on the street at stake, as far as LA government is concerned, that right includes menacing or even threatening people so long as you don't appear to have the immediate capability of carrying it out. So sure, that guy's telling you, you gotta die, but it's not like he's actually going to kill you, that appears to be the reasoning. But the rest of the city's policy and philosophy is crafted around something of an opposite premise, that given an opportunity, these people will actually clean up their lifestyles. As Gavin Newsom said in 2008, it's housing that solves homelessness, so simply give these people resources and the problem will go away. Where this philosophy is going awry, though, is in the assumption that those resources will be chosen. As the reporter in this story discovers, you can offer all the choices in the world for many of the homeless they choose to the extent that they're actually capable of choosing the continued comforts of the sidewalk, and that's if they're nice. If they're not, they'll try to fight you merely for offering. Sir, why are you throwing feces at people? This guy has to understand. I'm half paralyzed. I'm blind. I have no card for nine years. Sir, do you need help? The city is offering help. Me. I don't need help. Do you need help? Do you need help? Eva, are you okay? Do you need any help? You're not interested in housing? No. Okay, thank you, sir. And thus, the dilemma. The philosophy of those in power says nobody would ever choose this lifestyle given an alternative, but the evidence on the streets says otherwise by explicitly asking those who choose exactly that. Complicated not just by the moral questions of involuntarily removing these people from the streets and committing them to facilities elsewhere, but by the question of whether these people are mentally capable of making free choices at all. As the owner of one of these bars describes, he's like Nurse Ratched watching over the sidewalk mental institution on a daily basis. Every day is like another adventure of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It is like a psych, literally a psych ward. Except this institution is free roaming. If you're unlucky, your property is the institution. If you try to do anything about it, you'll be the criminal. If you appeal to the city about it, you'll be the indecent one. Paul Scrivano, one of the bar owners featured in this story, sent an email to his city councilwoman, Nithya Raman, who represents District 4, including Sherman Oaks, the site of this scene. The email included photos and videos of the same sort of behavior we've just watched. In response, the city councilwoman's staff said they understand the severity of the problem, but in the future, they request he does not send those types of photos and they will not respond if they contain inappropriate content, such as a person indecently exposed. The staffer says, while it is not right that Scrivano and his customers have been confronted in this way, it crosses a boundary to send the city council these photos unsolicited. So just to be clear, if you're confronted with a hobo's shit and balls right in front of your shop, well, that's just the cost of doing business and LAPD is forbidden from responding by city council order. But if the city council is subjected merely to a photo of the shit and balls consequences of their policy, well, that is the actual injustice that will be swiftly dealt with. And if you can't tell, the theme here is that they're above you. Their inconveniences are bigger problems than your actual victimization. You can see that premise confirmed by the nonsense reasoning that this email is somehow unsolicited. If you're a government representative, every single email from a constituent on a public issue like this is by definition solicited. You ran for office, thereby soliciting it. And this city councilwoman has evaded not just her constituents, but the press too. Apparently she ignored all requests for comment or interview until this reporter tracked her down on the streets. And as expected, she just repeated all the same talking points. We caught up with Councilwoman Rahman at a public event after fruitless attempts to set up an interview. How would you like it if somebody threw feces at you? I mean, I obviously would not like it. This issue is a humanitarian crisis and it's a crisis for the entire city of Los Angeles. Rahman says the only way to solve this crisis is to fix the problem that leads to homelessness. And that, she says, is lack of housing. The reality is that people who are experiencing homelessness are still individuals who 
are there on the streets because they don't have a home. We have two faulty premises here. Faulty, not just by theory or my own personal opinion, but faulty by all of the observable evidence that we've just watched in this report. Faulty premise one is that it's somehow compassionate to enable this sort of behavior. It is not. It is creating the shameful decay of the city and the continued suffering of both the homeless and the broader community together. Faulty premise two is that given the opportunity, the homeless would choose something other than this lifestyle. They haven't, they won't, and in many cases, they have mental conditions that preclude that sort of choice anyway, which creates an uncomfortable reality, certainly a little more comfortable than having your livelihood destroyed by a crazy person spontaneously renovating it into his own personal bathroom, but uncomfortable nonetheless. The premise of choice in this arrangement has to be largely removed, not because we all shouldn't have the freedom to craft our own lives, we should and we do, but because that freedom can't include the long-term occupation of public spaces or the sabotage of other people's property. Scrivano, the bar owner, is very blunt about that reality. Many of these people can't make a choice, and the choice that the city thinks it's offering isn't a justified one anyhow. In your opinion, what's the solution? The solution is that person who thinks he works for the FBI and who terrorizes my neighborhood is given the choice as to whether he wants housing or not. It's not a choice anymore. When people are suffering, you give them care. If they're really suffering, you pull them into care or you lose them. Well, he's only wrong about one small thing. That hobo does actually work for the FBI. He's the neighborhood informant. But other than that, he's exactly right. And I say that with a certain degree of hesitation, because on principle, I am no fan of empowering the authorities to involuntarily commit people into custody. But of course, there are all sorts of contexts in which we do that with perfect justification. We involuntarily commit people into custody when they commit crimes. And that's justified because they have violated the rights of others and that has a moral and legal obligation to be stopped. Yeah, well, this isn't necessarily criminal, you may respond. As long as they aren't attacking people or damaging property, we shouldn't treat these people like they've committed a crime. Granted, but we aren't. Nobody is proposing imprisoning people for sleeping on the streets. Nobody is proposing criminalizing homelessness. They are proposing removing people from the streets and relocating them to a place that's more suitable. Yes, for the same reasons that we consider that involuntary commitment justified in the criminal context. You do not have a right to a permanent presence on other people's property, and you certainly don't have a right to sabotage it. Even the most well-meaning homeless person does both of those things, even if only indirectly, by making the area less approachable to customers. And the most well-meaning homeless person should welcome the opportunity for an alternative anyway. If the LA progressives are correct, the opportunity for housing off the streets will be taken voluntarily. When it isn't, the question is why not? And there are two possible explanations. Either there is criminal intent, in which case there is a legal obligation to intervene, or it's pure mental illness and there's a moral obligation to intervene. But in no scenario is simply leaving these people on the streets the philosophically or morally justified thing to do. As wary as I am of many of the principles at stake here, the principle to maximize consent in every interaction between citizen and government, the principle to limit our urge to run to government to solve our every problem, at some point, you have to allow the theory in your head to confront and conform to the reality in the world. Because after all, it's reality that has to form your thoughts. It's not your thoughts that form reality. So even if some principles have to be lightly bent or just thought about in more critical detail, the scenes we just saw are not acceptable outcomes by any moral principle at all. Unless we want to believe that the principle is don't show me any pictures of it whenever the world contradicts my viewpoint. That hasn't worked out very well in the context of this particular problem, and it sure seems hard to make it any worse, but if there's one philosophy that could do it, that is the one. Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Parlor. that is at M L. 
Christians. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.